Everybody calls her Mo Wilson. Mo was an accomplished college skier from Vermont. A few years ago, she got into a sport called gravel racing. And in about three short years, she became one of the best in the world at it. On May 11th, 2022, at 9.15 p.m. in Austin, Texas, the last thing Mo did on this earth was scream in terror. And you hear those screams. There's a surveillance camera with an audio portion to it. We'll play that for you. And you'll hear those screams. Those screams are followed by ah! Ah! two gunshots. One to the front of the head, one to the side of the head that hits the index finger as it passes. You won't hear any more screams out there. Five seconds. And we intend to prove to you, and you put us in that chair, that after that four or five seconds of silence, Caden Armstrong stood over Mo Wilson and put a third shot right in Mo Wilson's heart. Council, Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Stewart, Mr. Jamie Sullivan, Mr. Rob Drummer, who will join us at some point. We intend to present to you approximately 40 witnesses from this witness chair to give you evidence over the next four to five days. We're going to start by giving you information about three key players. And you'll hear from Colin that the relationship was on again, off again. And you will hear that when the relationship was off, they both dated other people, but they continued to live together. And then we'll give you some more background on Colin. We were going to off again period in October of 2021. Colin began dating romantic relationship with Mo Wilson. 
see cell phone data calling is going back and forth with taking about calling numbers. And he sends her a text that says WTF with regards to her calling numbers. And you'll hear Colin tell you that he changed Mo Wilson's name to Christine Walls in his cell phone in an attempt to seek his communication with Mo Wilson. Because he'll tell you that after they dated, they remained friends. And you'll hear background on Kate Armstrong as well. One of the things you'll hear is she was not happy with his relationship with Colin. He'll communicate with Paul Wilson after they were back to that shit in. You'll hear testimony from this from some of Kate Armstrong's friends. And you'll hear that not only did she share that iPad and laptop with Colin, but she had access to his text messages through iMessages on those documents. He'll tell you that he was a hands-on kind of guy in his business. And Caitlin was the business manager type. So, in fact, you'll hear that she sent emails, messages out for the business from those two documents, I mean, from those two apparatus that had access to the email pretending to be him for the business. Not approve her access to those documents and access to his text messages through that iPad and that laptop. When you see text messages, when you see cell phone evidence of that phone call that Caitlin made to Paul Wilson in October 2021. And prior to May 11th, one of the things you'll find out about Caitlin Armstrong, the defendant, is that Colin had Matt Bride's guns on Lamar, bought two guns. He bought himself a gun, and he bought Caitlin. 9mm, 6 hour P365. And you'll find that in January 2022, four months with his murder, Kate Armstrong goes to the range, a gun range in South Austin, at 35 in Swamp. She dies. 50 rounds of ammo, you'll see the receipt from the ammo. And you'll see pictures on her cell phone of her practicing with that weapon, that six solid P365 9 millimeter. Four months before Mo Wilson was killed. And then we'll give you some more background before the murder that around the May 2nd, 2022 area of uh, uh, time frame, Colin Strickland left Austin in late April, and he was gone for about 30 days. He was in California. There was a bike gravel race in San Diego area. Colin will testify that during that late April, early May 2nd deadline, that his communication with Mo began to ramp up. Otherwise, they started to communicate a little bit more than they had in the past. And during this time period, when Colin's out on the road in California, texting more and more, I mean, texting more, more you would learn from this witness chair that Caitlin Armstrong is back home in Austin near that laptop. And that iPad that had access to iMessages to his information. 
Now, some very important things happened on May 2nd. A couple of things. On May 2nd, and you're learning some cell, down, cell data information, cell phone records. Caitlin Armstrong logged in to Colin Strickland's Gmail account and Instagram from her phone. Oh, she had access to his information. And another important thing happened on May 2nd. Caitlin Armstrong on her phone, you will be correct, look up Mo Wilson on her phone. And she looked up pictures of Mo Wilson on her phone. And they said, nine days before Mo And you'll learn that Colin leaves California and goes to Arizona, to Tucson, I believe. And that Kate decides to fly to Arizona to do it. After looking up Molly on the She gets to Arizona, and her and Colin drive back. They arrived back in Austin on May 9th. Colin and Caitlin from Arizona, they drive back, make stops along with they arrive back on May 9th. And uh, one of the things that Colin, uh, that Caitlin Armstrong does on May 9th, the two days before Mo Wilson's deal, she looks her up on the app on Strava. Strava app is an app that allows you to look at a person's activity. Now, you learn from the Strava people that the Strava app has a safety feature. You can put the safety feature on. When you're leaving home, you can post your ride through the mountains. But put the safety feature on, it starts a few blocks from your home. But if you don't put the safety feature on, it gives a pretty close general location of where you in your ride and where you end your ride. And you'll learn from the testimony from the witness here that when <coughs> Mo Wilson was in Austin, she did not activate her safety feature. She posted the ride. She could see where it began and where it began. Now on May 9th, she's looking up for her on Strava. She was moving her on the second. Now, Mo's not here yet. Because on May 10th, the very next day, as she's looking up, Mo shows up in Austin for a gravel locos race in Heiko, Texas. It's a 157 mile race that she was made to win. She didn't stay in a hotel. She stayed with a friend, Caitlin Cash. We call her Cash. Cash stayed in a garage apartment at 1708B Maple Drive. 1708, she stayed in D3 right behind the house. It's in East Austin, right off the MLK. That's where she stayed when she arrived on the 10th. Now, we'll give you some. Now, and on the 10th, May 10th, the day that Mo Wilson arrived in Austin, you hear testimony that Caitlin Armstrong looked up Mo on Strava for different Mo Wilson was murdered. Now, during that day, Colin and Mo began to text each other. And you'll see those text messages. They're trying to hook up for dinner. We go back and forth now. 
with time, we're going to go with things like that. You see those text messages. And Colin will tell you that later on that day, three o'clock range, he leaves on his motorcycle <coughs> to go to the dentist. And while he's out at the dentist visit, him and Mo finalize their plans to hook up for the evening and go to a eBay food. And he will testify. That, that texting was on his iPhone. It was connected through our messages to that iPad and laptop back at home. And you would be sell that direct. You showed the paper on from his back at home. Now, we're going to tell you what Melissa was doing the last day of her life. Before she went swimming, one of the last things she did on this earth was what she loved to do. She went on a three-mile bike ride from 123, and she arrived back at 423. We know that because she posted on Strava, and we know that because you'll also be presenting evidence that her cell phone data, which has locations, follows her and shows where she starts and where she goes, her whole route, and what she gets back to. You'll get that up there from the here. And at 4.49 p.m., on May 11th, she takes Talk about Kate Armstrong around the time of the text was sent. At 4 49 p.m., we have a text message was sent with the exact location of where Mo Wilson would be on May 11, 2022. The exact location when she texted her that. Seventh made the drive. Kate At 4.54 p.m., <clears throat> five minutes. With your testimony at five minutes after that text went to college, Caden Armstrong looks up what we're going to stop. Looks at that ride from 123 to 4.23. And you will see that. Then we're going to move you along to the evening of May 11th. At 5.43 p.m., Tyler picks up Mo. I mean, Caitlin Cash's apartment. They go to the Deep Eddy Pool, and there's a restaurant called Pool Burger across the street. Now, you'll see a couple of things that put them there. You'll see Colin and Mo's cell phone traveling in Cash's house to Pool Burger in Deep Eddy. And you'll see video of them sitting in a restaurant eating around the 8 o'clock period. And you'll even see a video of them leaving on a motorcycle 
who left at 8 o'clock on May 11th from the Pooh Bear area. Now, <coughs> Colin drops Mo off at 8.35 p.m. You'll hear Wheaton talk about his cell phone. Gets him right there in that alley. It's an alley behind the main house. I'm a street man. 8.35, he drops her off. And Colin goes home. And he's home at 9.15 and those gunshots go off. And we know he's home because you'll be able to hear witnesses crack him on his cell phone. He does stop at 8.38 on MLK a few blocks from dropping Mo off. And he texts Caitlin about that area he was running that was finished. Want to get something to eat? She doesn't respond. If you're able to learn that she doesn't respond to your cell phone. When he goes home, he receives a phone call about 9 o'clock. You'll hear from the person who called him. They was on the phone for eight minutes. You see cell phone records proving it. And then at 9 21, <clears throat> Colin sends Caitlin. One last text message. Yeah, I'm going home. And cell phone location puts Colin at his home, miles away from cell phone location. Miles away. 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 Mo comes home. Remember, Colin dropped her off at 8.35. A little small flight of stairs up Cass's garage apartment. At 8.36, Mo unlocks the door to Cash's apartment. And we know that because Cash has an app on her phone that sends her a message when the door is locked and unlocked. Not open and closed, just locked and unlocked. Cash was at dinner. She left her apartment before Mo going to dinner with friends as well. You hear that from Cash. So, she unlocks the door at 8.36. She goes in her apartment. And you were here from the sale Data experts and cell phone records that from 8:37 p.m. almost a minute after the door opens, she's on her phone. To be able to track her phone, just look at her phone. She's on her phone, calling at 8:37. One minute later, on her phone, and she stays on her phone. To 913. Consequently, you will also learn that within four or five feet of those stairs, there's a fence and a driveway. You will learn that at 8.37 p.m., one minute after she opened that door, Kayla Armstrong Jeep is seen going through that alley. One minute. After she opened that door, one minute later, you see that Jeep going through Video surveillance kind of One minute. 36, 837, 838, probably <clears throat> a few blocks away from Texas. You hear all that from witness. Now, Mo sends her last message out at 9.13 p.m. She sent a text message to a podcast. Two minutes. Now, you heard from Kate and Cash. She had gone to dinner. Good friend of mine, Mo was standing. She 
she arrives home and sees Mo on the floor. Just sees her legs. She'll testify. She thought Mo had been on a strenuous ride and was laying on the floor, stretching, relaxing. And she'll testify that she gets closer and sees blood and freaks out. And at 9.54 p.m., within seconds of being in an apartment, she calls 911. And she'll tell you that she put the phone on speaker and the 911 operator had her doing chest compressions to her friend. She'll tell you she had no idea she was dead, whether she was dead or not. You hear testimony that she the closest friend's chest about eight times for eight to ten minutes until the first responder showed up and took over. The police talked to her that night and she tells them that she left before Mo. She tells them who Mo is. They don't know who she is. She's a friend of mine. San Francisco, she's here visiting. I don't know, she was supposed to have been with a friend named Colin Strickton. And she even shows him a text message where Mo texts her and said, Hey, what are you doing, Colin? To begin with, please. Now, to, to police continue to investigate. They canvassed the area for surveillance, videos, and they locate a black Jeep with a very distinct bicycle rack with three racks on it at 8.37 p.m. In an alley about five feet of cash is spared. It's a little fence that separates them. 837. That's the Jeep I was just telling you about. Passing that alley. One minute I should open that door. We're going to present evidence to you. That's Kate Armstrong's <coughs> Jeep. Please bring in Colin Frickin. The next day on May 3rd. Police interviewed Colin, confirms his story. He tells them all the things you're going to hear about. I picked her up. I was on a motorcycle. Deep Eddie, Food Burger, they canvas and get video to prove that stuff eventually. Now, Police also sent somebody to Collins' house to investigate. To sit on the house and watch that house while they were interviewing Collins, his main police officer. Once the detective learned about this black Jeep in the alley, he asked Collins about this black Jeep. Colin would testify, he told him, that's her Jeep. She owned it, she got it. I'm not saying I've never driven it, it's okay. But I wasn't driving it that day. I was on my motorcycle. So now, Caitlin Armstrong becomes the person of interest as well. Because they're concerned about why that Jeep was at 17 or make it at 8.37 p.m. Now, the police go to get Caitlin Armstrong. They look her up. And they find that she got some Class B warrant. They pick her up and they bring her in. And you'll see, we hear from Detective Connor, who has her in the room talking to her. And apparently, Detective Connor would tell her, yeah, that's some kind of mistake with this woman. The birthday is mixed up or something. Not sure if she 
We're going to release you. You can go. You're free to go. At the same time, the police have got a search warrant for this search for house. Now, you'll see that when Caitlin is in that room with Detective Conn, she says, I want to leave. But she doesn't get a leave. She continues to stay there. Detective Connor continues to tell her more about it and ask her questions. I just want to hear your side of the story and you tell me why your Jeep is at the scene of this murder. Doesn't say anything. Does say something like, I didn't know how to get her. Same girl she'd been searching on May 2nd, May 9th, May 10th. And eventually, they do release her from the police station that day. But here's no explanation why the Jeep is here. They didn't do it. Now, from that search warrant at Colin and Caitlin's home, they find two things that are very important to this case. Two guns. One. Smith, it's Collins gun. They find a nine millimeter, six hour P365 that belongs to Caitlin Armstrong. And that gun is later identified through ballistics <coughs> as a firearm that was used to kill Mobile. Now, the day after this interview, May 13th, some important things happened. You'll see Kayla Armstrong on a video camera at CarMax in South Austin, near their home. She goes to CarMax and she sells her Jeep for $12,000. You'll see a video of her in CarMax. On that same day, you'll see an Uber receipt. She rides an Uber to Austin Berkshire Airport after she sold her car. And you'll also be presented evidence. It's the next day, she rode to Uber's airport on the 13th, but the next day on May 14th, she flies from Austin to Houston and from Houston to New York City. You'll we'll see the flight receipts. And you'll learn that on May 18th, a few days later, and you'll also learn that she has a sister, Christina Armstrong, that lives in New York, New Jersey. On May 18th, you'll be presented testimony of her going online using her credit card, her email, buying a plane ticket to Costa Rica with her sister's name listed as the passenger on May 18th. And on that same day, she flies to Costa Rica using her sister Christine Armstrong to pass it. She goes to Costa Rica and assumes a different identity. And on June 22nd, while in Costa Rica, she has plastic surgery. You'll see the medical records of Dr. Badia. She spends $6,425 to change her appearance. 
you would also see before and after photos in those medical records. That's on June 22nd. Two days later on June 29th, the U.S. Marshals locate Caleb Armstrong in Costa Rica. Have no jurisdiction, notify the local authorities. Get together, they work it out. And a few days after June 29th, Caleb Armstrong is returned to the United States. Now, I want to backtrack a little bit and tell you a little bit about the cell phone data that you're going to see. Cell phone data can include calls, text messages, and also location information. It can tell who you call, who you text, and where you are. Let's talk about Collins' cell phone data. You can see those text messages I told you about between the two. You see him traveling on a cell phone location to pick her up. You will see him traveling to Bloomberg. Yeah. You will see him traveling from Bloomberg. You will see him leaving the scene at 8:35, dropping her off, and you will see him stop and make that text message at 8:38 through cell phone records. You'll see that 9 o'clock phone call the last eight minutes. You'll see that 9:21 text, and you'll be able to see from the cell phone expert that he's way at home at 9.15 when those shots rang out. You'll be able to tell it from the cell data. Then we look at Mo, sales, Mo Wilson's cell data. You'll be able to see that ride she took, the last ride of her life. 123, 423 p.m. on May 11th. Hopefully not. And you'll see her location to help you verify what time she got home. You got Cash's information saying it goes on May 36. You'll be able to look at the cell, down, cell data to see if it also says she got home at 36. You'll be able to see that to verify. And you'll also see that from 8.37 to 9.13, she was on her phone in that apartment. And you'll even see evidence afterwards that that's the front door. Here's a couch. After she's murdered, you'll see that cell phone on that couch plugged into a white charger right there, right by the door. You hear this very small apartment. She was a few feet away to the bathroom. But at 9.13, That cell phone is right there when she sent that last message, right by that front door. And you'll see that last text that she sent to the podcast. You'll see Kate Moss cell phone. These cell phone people tell you. They can get your stuff from your cell phone, unlock your cell phone, through the cloud, all kind of ways. You will see her cell phone and a GPS that I'm going to tell you about this in her Jeep. You will see them traveling later that day, side by side, so you can verify the accuracy of it. And you'll also see from the cell phone people that at 7.30 p.m., on May 11th, turn the cell phone on. Turn it off. By the way, June 29th, 
You have talked with the other coach of the week? Yeah. What's up on that? And also, you'll see that at 9.55, approximately 35 minutes or so, after you hear that scream <coughs> on that audio in the ring camera, her cell phone is turned back on. At her house in South Park. And you'll see locations after that cell phone. And you'll learn that on May 27, while in Costa Rica, she searched her name from her cell phone, news articles, things about her arrest, things about her being a fugitive. You'll see that through the cell phone data people. She's looking at all this and reading this stuff put it up on her phone while she's in Costa Rica on May 27th. After the murder, but before the plastic surgery, you see her Googling this once before her arrest and stuff. Now, I told you the police was cameras the video surveillance. You'll see one video video surveillance camera of Colin leaving that motorcycle at 836 once he dropped Mo off at Cassidy Park. Got it one time on video camera. Now, there's four video surveillance cameras that captures Caitlin Armstrong circling Cash's house at 1708 Maple for about an hour before the murder. It's circling. One camera catches it three or four times. He's passing up down the street on that black Jeep that she sold at Carnax. Now, one of them videos that catches her in the front of the house, in the back of the house, they have cameras on both sides, front and back of the house. That's the camera that catches her along the fence of the 36. One minute after. Now, you will find that many cars, and this Jeep here had an infotainment center. And within that infotainment center, there's GPS. You hear that Caitlin Armstrong Jeep had an infotainment center with a GPS system in it. GPS. Shows time and location data. You'll see an animation of her driving down Lamar with the docks. Starting about 6 p.m. It's tracking her all over the city, North Austin, driving around. You'll see a circling block around the house. And you'll see the experts look at the video ring time and the GPS on the Jeep, Jeep time to verify the accuracy. For example, the GPS says she's on this street, the ring time takes a picture. You see that side by side. Now, GPS has what they call trip logs. Everybody's trip logs. Trip law cuts off the Jeep is on. The car is on. You hear about trip law 99, trip law 100. Trip law 99 stops at 8.40 p.m. GPS location puts Kevin Armstrong Jeep in an alley about 15, 20 yards from those stairs. That Mo Wilson went up at 8 30 GPS y'all will testify that at 9 17 p.m., two minutes 
Not to go to fatal shots. Trip log 100 starts. That Jeep starts up and starts to move. Two minutes later, this is going to come up and stay this way. It's parked up at 840, no activity, turned off. Two minutes up the road, that Jeep is back home and it's gone. And one of the things about this Jeep is we follow this Jeep on GPS all the way to the home in South Austin. You see that it stops by an apartment complex in the dumpster on the way home. Stop by the dumpster for a minute. The GPS shows that the car is moving when it stops. I'll cross, how fast it's going, it's not moving at all. You see her go up to that dumpster by the apartment complex, stop. For a few minutes, then you're gonna see her drive off home, cut that Jeep off, and trip log 100 is gonna end. Right around 9:55 p.m. same time, that phone popped back on at her home. Now, you're gonna hear from a ballistics and two mark expert. There were three shell casings. Three projectiles covered at the scene. One of the projectiles was too mangled to compare. So he had three shell cases, two projectiles to use for comparison. So they got those two guns that they got from the search warrant. Collins gun, and Caitlin's six tower P365 9 millimeter. They test fired those guns and compared those test fires casings to those five found at the scene. From that chair, the ballistics guy is going to tell you how that's going to be excluded. Caitlin's gun. were identified the results will show that those cases, test cases, were identified as being the same as fired from that gun. That's what he's going to testify. But that six hour P365 9mm, the same gun, fired those cases as 17 million made the drive. And you're also going to hear from DNA experts. Now, you hear that they swabbed DNA from Mo Wilson's bike, which they found in some weeds, maybe 10 yards from the bottom of those stairs, cut four or five yards from where that car was parked at 840, and some bamboo weed. They found her bike. <coughs> You will find that the bike weighs about five or six pounds. You can pick it up like with one hand. You'll find it's a very expensive bike, thousands of dollars. And you remember that earlier she was riding this bike. Now, the DNA expert will tell you that she took DNA from Mo Wilson, Caitlin Armstrong, and Colin Strickson to compare to the DNA. On that bike. Now, they found DNA on the handlebars. Now, the DNA, DNA expert will tell you that they don't say that's the person. They got likelihood ratio. Uninformative, five categories. Uninformative with the lowest, strongly, strong, and very strong likelihood. That's how they keep it down. You will find, or she'll testify, that the DNA on the handlebars was a very strong likelihood that the DNA on the handlebars included DNA from Caitlin Armstrong. Strong. And the DNA expert will testify that with regards to the DNA on the seat 
of the Bible. That there's a very strong likelihood that the DNA on the seat of the bike included DNA from Kate Armstrong. Very strong, highest category to have. And on October 11th, 2023, 19 days before this trial began, you're going to hear testimony that Kate Armstrong escaped from the Travis County Jail. And was apprehended about a mile down the road. 19 days before this trial. We, when we present this evidence to you through these 40 witnesses here, we're going to ask you to find Kayla Armstrong guilty of murdering Mo Wilson. Thank you so much for your time. So why are we here? Why are we here? Have you heard the state get up and tell you this is an open and shut case, right? There's DNA, ballistics, GPS evidence. State's certainly convinced. That's all very important. So why are we here? You may already have your mind made up. I know Detective Richard Spittler with the Austin Police Department certainly did, just hours into his investigation. So why are we here? We are here because the state's opinion of what the evidence is and the Austin Police Department's opinion of what the evidence is isn't important. You are the most important people in this room. It is your opinion of the evidence that we are here for. That's why we're here. Reasonable doubt. I want to talk to you about reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt is doubt that is supported. Jeff, you've made an argument about the weight of evidence. He's not giving a roadmap. I, I plan to, Your Honor. Reasonable doubt is doubt that is supported by reason and common sense. And I expect at the end of this trial that we will be talking about doubt, what that is. But for purposes of my remarks to you this morning, I want to talk to you about reason and common sense. Now, reason. Because once again, that's not a roadmap for evidence. That's argument. Judge, just a state. Judge, can we approach? Yes. just discussed with you what you will see, what you will hear about, what you will hear throughout the course of this trial. But I want to talk to you about what you didn't hear about. What you didn't hear about. You didn't hear that not one witness saw Caitlin Armstrong allegedly commit this murder. Not one, because there isn't one. You didn't hear. I'm going to object again. He's supposed to present the evidence over that he's going to show, not evidence that he's not going to show. Once again, this is argument. The implication from the argument is that the evidence 
that you over the state that you stated over the state states one thing, and he's pointing out what that evidence does not show. That would be permissible, but we would limit it to that and not argue it as to the facts of the case or why it does not amount to the burden of proof that would be in this instance. Thank you, Your Honor. You won't hear, and you didn't hear, about any camera footage showing Caitlin Armstrong at the scene of this shooting. Despite there being tons of cameras in the area, and you heard opening statements about all the cameras that were in the immediate vicinity of the scene of that shooting, not one captures Caitlin Armstrong at that scene because there isn't any. You did not hear about any direct evidence showing Caitlin Armstrong is responsible for this crime because there isn't any. Now, you will hear at the time Caitlin left Austin to go to New York and then to Costa Rica, she would have no reason to know about any warrant that was present in this case. But the Austin Police Department told her she was free to go. She was free to go. That's what you will hear. You will hear that Kate is passionate about traveling. She's passionate about yoga. And you're going to hear that she was totally comfortable <coughs> traveling to far off locations that intrigued her at the drop of a hat on a moment's notice. That's what you'll hear. And you'll hear in the days following the shooting, weird things were happening to Kate at her home, documented things, things that would cause a reasonable person to fear for their safety. And that ultimately led to her decision to leave Austin. And you're going to hear people among us who are weak to begin with, who are troubled to begin with, who are damaged to begin with, are more likely to fall into that kind of state of reaction, an attempt to retreat. So let's talk about some of the witnesses that you may hear about over the course of this trial. Detective Richard Spitler. Now, he's the detective who, prior to the investigation of this case, had never served as a lead detective in a murder investigation. Not one. But I'm sure he did very well on his exams. You're also going to hear from Detective Katie Conn. Now, she's the detective that will tell you she's never met a defendant she couldn't crack in an interrogation, even if they invoked their rights multiple times throughout the conversation, asked for their lawyer multiple times throughout the conversation, asked to leave multiple times throughout the conversation. Now, the state is going to attempt to tie Ms. Armstrong to this shooting through purported forensic science. And you'll hear from a DNA analyst that examined some items that were collected in this case. And you will hear from a ballistic technician who will tell you he eyeballed some shell casings that were submitted in this case and determined that they were not inconsistent with a firearm that was taken from the home of Kate and Colin. But you will also hear from experts. And I want you to listen when those experts tell you DNA reporting can mean very little. And ballistic science isn't a science at all. And it's not highly regarded by members of the general scientific community. <coughs> I'm going to check that. There's no evidence that it's not highly regarded by the general science community just because you can find one or two people to say that. Judge, these are opening remarks. This is what we expect the evidence to show. This is proper argument. Thank you. Before that objection was overruled, we were talking about ballistic science and how that is far from the gold standard that you see it depicted as on TV. Now, the states and the officers with the Austin Police Department scientists that they employ 
they were so desperate to keep Caitlin Armstrong in their crosshairs that they had tunnel vision and jumped to conclusions. And at the end of this evidence, you will be left with the conclusion that the state's purported <coughs> forensic science is inaccurate, is unreliable, and unscientific. Now, words and phrases have the meaning that we give them. Words and phrases are meaningless unless jurors like you draw a hard line in the sand. Phrases like presumption of innocence. Proof beyond any reasonable doubt. Once again, he's Judge, this is the burden of proof. If the state is apprehensive about the jury hearing about I'm apprehensive about him not giving a roadmap and giving an argument at open statement. That's what I'm apprehensive about. You said four words. I don't know where you're going from there, so I'll allow you to finish your sentence to see if it is part of open statement. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. You must approach the task of your evaluation of the evidence with the willingness to think that which I know as a thought, as a person, as a human, know to be the most difficult words to say, I don't know. I don't know. And I want you to approach that task. So once again, he's talking about how the jury weighs evidence. He's not talking about the foundation of what he's laying, what he expects to prove. Judge, this is appropriate for your honor. I, I didn't hear the words from I just said this is opening statement. I haven't made a ruling, but I would ask again that you could find your remarks to the appropriate statements for this juncture of the trial. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't know. It, it, at the end of the evidence, that is your conclusion. We don't know. The appropriate verdict is not guilty. As you approach that jury room, if that is your conclusion, we don't know, not for sure, then the appropriate verdict is not guilty. The state has a job to do. We have a job to do. And you stand between us. And we stand. Judge, that's not opening statement. Objection sustained. With Caitlin Armstrong. A woman who is trapped in a nightmare of circumstantial evidence. Honest, that's not opening statement. Judge, that's I'm argument. discussing the evidence. And that You're it is discussing her state of mind. Yeah, that's not evidence. Okay. We have an awesome responsibility. Yours is more awesome. And at the end of the evidence, you will be left with the conclusion that the state has fallen short of the incredibly high burden that they have willingly accepted in choosing to accuse this woman of a very serious crime. You had your chance. You could have been excused on Monday. So but you, that's not open statement. But you told us you could be fair. That's the same line of question. It's not open statement. I'm trying to wrap it up, Your Honor. And you're not doing open statement. Let's wrap it up appropriately as far as what the evidence from your portion uh, of the trial or what you intend to show or the things will be shown to the jury. I'm trying to get there, Your Honor. Without our, let's do it without yes. Our. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. At the end of this case, your responsibility is more awesome. And you will have the conclusion that the state has fallen short of its burden. So once again, every time you sustain, he goes, gets up and says the same thing. He's making arguments about how they weigh the evidence at the end of the trial. Judge, that's not open statement. It is 
the burden of proof, Your Honor, that the jury has in this case, if the state's apprehensive about the burden of proof that they've accepted. Okay. There's a time and place to talk about the burden of proof. There's no open statement. Let me stop. There are no further statements about what the evidence is going to show. Then we can move on to the next portion of the trial. So you've heard that statement that you've made a few times now. So I would ask you if there's nothing else about the evidence. There is, Your Honor. Okay. We trusted you then. And we trust that at the conclusion of this trial, when you look at the evidence, you will come to a just verdict. And that just verdict, we trust, will be a verdict of not guilty. 